David the Polygamist. That's the title for our message this evening. And that's the title because this is what we see as we continue our study through the book of 2 Samuel. We're up to chapter 3, and chapter 3 opens with a list of David's wives. Yes, wives, plural. Now we could easily uh, skip over this passage and get to the action, but I thought it would be good for us to reflect on these verses and to use them as a springboard for thinking about the issue of polygamy in the Bible. Uh, What are we to make of it? Uh, How do we square away the famous polygamists in the Old Testament with what we believe the Bible teaches about marriage and sexuality? If it was okay for David, is it okay for people today to have multiple partners? Was it okay for David? Now this is going to be more like a talk or a lecture than a sermon and given the content I thought it might be helpful to have some questions at the end. So if a question comes to mind, note it down and at the end please ask it. Uh, Your question and the discussion it generates might help all of us. So let's read the text and then I'm going to pray and ask for God's help as we study his precious word this evening. 2 Samuel chapter 3 beginning at verse 1. Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, but David waxed stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And unto David were sons born in Hebron, And his firstborn was Amnon of Ahinoam, the Jezreelites, and his second, Kileb of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Makar, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshua, and the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, and the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abital, and the sixth, Ethraim, by Eglah, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I ask that you would help us now as we study your word. Please give us understanding. Please help us to find the message that you have here for us. Uh, I pray that you would help us to concentrate, keep us alert, and be with us now, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now hopefully you remember our previous messages in this series and you know that at this point in the narrative Israel was divided. Uh, David had been accepted as king over Judah and a man called Abner had set up a rival king in the north over the other tribes, a son of Saul named Ishbosheth, and war had broken out. Now in, our, in our last message we saw the first battle in this war. It began with a contest in what was later called the Field of Stone Knives. Now we're told here in verse 1 that as the war progressed, the house of Saul became weaker and the house of David grew stronger. David's kingdom was winning and it wouldn't be too long before David was made king over all Israel. We see that in the first part of chapter 5 and I'm sorry to spoil it for you. In these verses here in chapter 3, the narrator pauses and tells, us, uh, tells the reader about the house of David as he reigned in Hebron. Now, when he settled in Hebron, David married four more wives. Now, from chapter 2, we know that he already had two wives that he brought with him to Hebron. We're also given the names of the first son that David had with each of these wives. We're not told this, but I think it's very unlikely (laughs) that the first child that David had with each of these women was a boy. That would be uh, pretty remarkable if it were the case. You know, six from six. (laughs) I would suggest there were some daughters as well. But what we have here are the names of the first sons that David had with these women. These were the princes of Judah. Now as I alluded to earlier, what do we do with this? Okay, we could just skip over this and move on to the narrative, but this is in the Bible. God put it here for us to read and to pay attention to. 
Clearly, David, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the great king, the man after God's own heart, the one whose star is on the flag today, had more than one wife. (laughs) He had more than two wives. He was a polygamist. And he wasn't alone. Abraham is one of the most significant figures in the Bible, and he had two wives, or at least a wife and a concubine. Jacob had two wives. During the time of the divided kingdom, at least six of the kings of Judah had more than one wife. So again, what are we to make of this? Now before I answer that, I'll tell you why we need to think this through. I want to share with you some interesting words. Now the first word you've heard before, but perhaps not the other ones, we'll see. Uh, The first word is polygamy, and I've used it six or seven times already in this message. Polygamy is the practice or custom of having more than one wife or husband at the same time. Interestingly, in the Bible, we don't have any examples of a woman having more than one husband at the same time. And while I haven't studied this, my guess is that throughout history, wherever polygamy has been practiced, it has mostly been in the form of men having multiple wives. Now the technical word for having more than one wife at the same time is polygyny and the technical word for having more than one husband at the same time is polyandry, just to confuse you. The word polygamy covers both. Now we don't really have to worry about polygamy in Australia because it is illegal. And just to confuse you even more, the criminal offence of marrying someone while legally married to someone else is called bigamy. So there's another word. And this is what the law says. A person who is married shall not go through a form or ceremony of marriage with any person, and the penalty is imprisonment for five years. And that's according to the Marriage Act 1961 Commonwealth. Now, according to ChatGPT, there are only nine countries in the world where polygamy is legal or tolerated with restrictions. And these are all majority Islamic countries, except for one. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, UAE, Jordan, Yemen, Libya, Malaysia, Indonesia, and it is legal for Muslims living in Nigeria. In most places in the world, it's illegal. However... That doesn't mean we can ignore this subject and move on. Something like polygamy still exists and is on the rise in the Western world today. Now, adultery has been around for a very long time. Infidelity, cheating, and thankfully our society still takes a dim view of that kind of behaviour. And there are unmarried people who sleep around And sadly, that's not as frowned upon as it once was. Uh, Promiscuity has been normalised in our culture with devastating results. But neither of these are like polygamy. Adultery is not the same thing. Being promiscuous is not the same thing. That's not what I'm talking about. I want to show you two more interesting words. The first word is polyamory which is having or desiring multiple intimate relationships at the same time with the full knowledge and consent of all parties involved. We've seen a growing discussion about this in the media and on social media in the last decade or so. Uh, This lifestyle has become more mainstream and there is serious psychological literature out there that explains the various kinds of polyamorous relationships. Okay, these are marriage-like relationships that involve more than two people. Now, polyamory is, and here's another interesting term, I would call it Satan speak. Polyamory is a form of ethical non-monogamy, which is an approach to relationships where people can have more than one romantic or intimate partner at a time, and everybody involved is aware and enthusiastically consents to the dynamic. Now that's a very tricky use of the word ethical, isn't it? (laughs) Who decides what's ethical? 
Now, these relationships are presented in documentaries, in new news articles and in YouTube videos as being very mature and reasonable. Supposedly, people can get together and agree to these kinds of arrangements, to having multiple partners. They believe they can make it work for everyone's benefit. But of course, it's totally immoral, it's very bad for children, and it's a lie. These relationships don't work and cannot work. Hey, we simply aren't wired as human persons to be okay with arrangements like these, no matter how enlightened we pretend to be. This, I would argue, is the modern incarnation of polygamy. It's polygamy after the advent of feminism. It's not the same as what we see in ancient societies or in some Islamic societies today, but it's still this idea of having multiple spouses, even if you're not legally married to them. And that brings us back to David. As I said earlier, if David and others in Scripture had multiple partners, then why can't we today? What's the problem? Why can't I, as someone who worships the same God that David worshipped, have a household that looks like this? Okay. Why would that be wrong? Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't want a household that looks like this, but I think you understand the question. How do we square away these practices in the Old Testament with what we believe about marriage? How can we say that polyamory is immoral when the fathers of our faith were engaged in something very similar? I think we need some answers. So here we go. I'm going to begin by very briefly running through the names of uh, were given in this list in 2 Samuel chapter 3. Some of them are very familiar to us. Uh, the first two names are David's wife Ahinoam, Ahinoam and his eldest son Amnon. What do we know about Amnon? Well, in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 13, we're told that he sexually assaulted his half-sister Tamar and la then later on was murdered by his half-brother Absalom in revenge. When we talk about bad things happening in families, this was right up there. And this was horrific. Next, the text mentions Abigail and Kiliab. Abigail was Nabal's widow. We're told that story in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Kiliab is also called Daniel. He probably died at a young age because he is never mentioned again except in a genealogy. The third wife in this list is Ma'aka. She, she was mother to Absalom. Now she was uh, the daughter of Talmai, the king of Geshur. Geshur was a small kingdom on the eastern side of the Jordan River. And this was probably a political marriage. Okay, it sealed an alliance between Judah and Geshur. As David was establishing his reign in Hebron, this kind of alliance would have been very strategic, very helpful, and again, it was probably sealed by this marriage. We know that the son that David had with this wife, Absalom, murdered his half-brother Amnon in revenge for his sister Tamar, and he led a rebellion against David. The account of Absalom's rebellion is given to us in 2 Samuel chapters 13 to 18, and it was probably the lowest point in David's reign. Absalom was eventually killed by Joab. The fourth wife recorded here is Haggith, and David's first son with her was Adonijah. Now we know nothing about Haggith, only that she was mother to Adonijah. When David was in his final days, Adonijah was probably his oldest surviving son. We know that Amnon and Absalom were dead. We don't read anything about Kileb, so I think it's reasonable to conclude that Adonijah was the oldest son at the end of David's life. We know that he attempted to succeed David, but was thwarted. And we read about this in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5 to chapter 2, verse 25. And he didn't become king because David had promised the throne to Bathsheba's son, Solomon. 
that we have two more wives mentioned on this list and their eldest sons. It's a bit exhausting going through all these wives, isn't it? <laughs> Number five, there's Abital and her son Shephatiah. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about these two. And then there is Igla and her son Ithraim. And again, the Bible doesn't tell us anything about these two either. So David, while in Hebron, had these six wives and a growing family of children. But there was more. Before he married these women, David had married Michael, the daughter of Saul. But if you remember, she had been separated from him by her father and given to another man. Now Michael came back into David's life, and we'll get to that story in our study through 2 Samuel. Years later, David would marry Bathsheba, and we know that story. So all up, David had eight wives, at least eight that we know about. But <laughs> that's not all. As well as eight wives, David had at least ten concubines. Now, these were probably household servants who David had intimate relationships with. Uh, I haven't done enough study to fully understand the status of concubines in ancient Israel. For our purposes, we can probably use the word partner. Okay, they, these were not wives, but partners. And David had an obligation to look after them and any children he had with them. So David had at least 18 women in his life. And just as an aside, uh, we usually think of Solomon when it comes to this subject, don't we? We think of Solomon. But uh, where did Solomon learn it from? Well, he learned it from his dad. Uh, David set the example and Solomon ran with it. And uh, that brings us to some, some hard truths. Some hard truths. David was a polygamist. Plus he had other partners. Moreover, as I said a moment ago, some of the most significant figures in the Bible were polygamists. Abraham, Jacob, Solomon, Joash. According to one scholar, there are 33 reasonably clear historical cases of polygamy and or concubinage out of approximately 3,000 men mentioned in the scriptural record. I think that's quite a lot. Most of the men mentioned in scripture appear in name only. We're not told anything about their family life or what they did. There are hundreds of names mentioned in genealogies and in other lists. So that we have these 33 cases is significant. How many more of those 3,000 men mentioned in the Bible had multiple wives? Now, the examples of polygamy and concubinage in the Bible are not the same as modern-day polyamory, but they are something we have to address as we seek to defend the biblical view of marriage and sexuality. Again, what are we supposed to think about this? What do we say when non-Christians press us about this? Now, how can we argue for our position when this is in the Bible? Now, the question that summarises the issue is something like this. Why did God condone polygamy? Or to put it another way, why was God okay with this? Well, the answer is, he wasn't. He didn't condone or approve of this practice. And that's what I want to show you in the remainder of this message. I'm going to consider three points with you. Three things that demonstrate that God did not approve of polygamy. But before we get to them, there is a question that came into my mind as I was preparing this message. And perhaps it's a question that you've thought about. And I believe we, we need to answer it. Why was there no law in the Old Testament prohibiting polygamy? Okay, why didn't God put a blanket ban on this practice? Thou shalt not have more than one wife or one husband. Okay, that would have made this whole issue very straightforward. There isn't such a command in the law of Moses. Why not? Well, first of all, we have to recognise that there is a difference between approving something and not prohibiting it. Just because God didn't ban something doesn't mean he thought it was okay. 
we make this distinction all the time. There are things that we don't approve of, but we don't necessarily think should be illegal. Uh, there are many things in society that I think people should be allowed to do, but I don't approve of those things. I don't think it's okay for them to do it. I can make that distinction, and we understand it. Just because God didn't forbid polygamy entirely in the law doesn't mean he sanctioned it. It doesn't mean he thought it was okay. Secondly, we have to recognize that polygamy was practiced long before God gave Israel the law. We have examples in scripture of polygamous marriages before Israel received the law at Mount Sinai. The law was given to a people, it came into a society where this was probably happening and had been happening for centuries. Now, some believe Leviticus chapter 18 verse 18 banned polygamy altogether. And you can look up that verse later on if you like. I don't agree with that interpretation. But it certainly banned one form of polygamy. That is, a man was not to marry sisters. Apparently that was not uncommon in pagan societies. Indeed, that's what Jacob had done, married sisters, Rachel and Leah. But the law strictly forbid this practice. But there is a sense in which in the law, the Lord acknowledged that there were and there would be polygamous marriages. And so he gave two commandments about them. The law contained a rule about inheritance in the case of polygamy, uh, which we won't get into this evening and a rule about providing for a betrothed maidservant, probably a concubine, if a man took another wife. Again, I don't think we're supposed to read these as God placing his stamp of approval on polygamy. Rather, he was acknowledging that it would be practiced, and he wanted to look after the most vulnerable participants in these arrangements. I think the closest thing we have to the law's approach to polygamy is the law's approach to slavery. And neither of these were ideal, but they existed. They were part of the social fabric and had been for a long time. Like slavery, the Old Testament law, while not approving of polygamy, recognised its existence and regulated it. And in fact, there may have been a good reason not to ban polygamy outright. In ancient societies, it was more important than it is today for a woman to have an attachment to a man. It was very difficult for a woman on her own to have food, shelter and protection. And there was no social housing or parenting payment or Medicare. <laughs> like slavery, polygamy may have acted as a kind of social safety net. But when we read the Old Testament... We have to be careful not to project modern social and economic norms back into the text. Her life was very different. If a woman didn't have a husband, she and her children may have starved or been abused, or she may have been forced to sell herself and her children into slavery. Uh, becoming a man's second wife might have been a lifesaver for her. And so again, there may have been good reasons not to ban polygamy outright. So there was no general law banning polygamy, but we can see that the law did not approve of it. It was not okay. And I'm going to give you three points that show us this. Number one, the commandment for kings. But the Lord was very clear with Israel about this matter when it came to their kings. The Lord anticipated that one day they would want a king and so he gave some commandments for Israel and for the king. They're in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17 verses 14 through 17. It says, When thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shall say, I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me, thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shalt thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. But he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to the end that he should multiply horses. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. And here it is, neither shall he multiply wives to himself.' 
that his heart turned not away, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. This was a command forbidding Israel's king from following the ancient custom of having a harem. Uh, this is what you did if you were an absolute monarch. Uh, you did it because you could, and you did it often to seal political alliances. And it's interesting to me how widespread and enduring this custom was, from the Ottomans and the Mughals to the emperors of China and the kings of Thailand. They all had harems. Israel's king would have been tempted to follow this practice, the practice of the kings of the nations that surrounded them. But the Lord said, no, he shall not multiply wives to himself. Now David had two wives before he became king, three if you include Michael or Michal, and then he took more. So he clearly disobeyed this commandment. Now the Lord knew the impact that multiplying wives would have uh, on a king. Uh, the text says that his heart turned not away. That's how the commandment concludes. A king's many wives would turn his heart away from the Lord and away from his duties. Uh, he would end up being given over to the desires of his flesh. Uh, what man wouldn't end up being devoted to pleasure? What man wouldn't end up living in debauchery if he could have an endless supply of women to share his bed? If he multiplied wives, his heart would be turned away from the Lord and turned towards the worship of false gods, especially if he married pagan wives in order to seal political alliances. And we know this was exactly what happened with Solomon. But there were other reasons for this command, forbidding the king to have multiple wives. I'd like to suggest four, and I won't comment on them. The king was not to multiply wives uh, in order to avoid the family chaos that would inevitably ensue with multiple wives and multiple heirs. Uh, to guard Israel's king from relying on political alliances sealed by marriage when he ought to trust the Lord. Uh, to protect Israel's king from entanglement with pagan kingdoms and their influence to ensure the welfare of the king's wives and children. And how could a king fulfill his responsibilities as a husband and a father if he had many wives and dozens of children? Now, the Lord was very clear when it came to the king. Polygamy was forbidden. But you might be thinking, well, I understand that. But uh, this commandment was very narrow in its application. What about everyone else? How do we know that God didn't approve of polygamy in general? Well, this becomes clear when we think about the way history is told. And this is the second point. An author can tell a story in such a way so as to communicate what they really think about something without explicitly saying so. Uh, the details they choose to include or not to include, the way they portray the characters, the way they unfold the narrative will tell the reader what they think. And we all studied novels like this in high school, where we recognised the message the author was sending, uh, the statements they were making about certain social customs or about politics or morality or the environment or whatever it might be. Well, the Lord does this in the way he portrays polygamy in the Old Testament. There is not a single example in the Old Testament of a happy polygamous household. In fact, the history recorded in the Old Testament is told in such a way so as to highlight the unhappiness and dysfunction of polygamous households. Now, the Lord could have chosen to record uh, some happy moments <laughs> where uh, everyone in a polygamous, house, uh, polygamous household was getting on just fine. But we don't see that. Instead, the Lord has given us accounts of many unhappy moments in polygamous households. Moments when there was jealousy and conflict and bitterness and strife, even violence and death. Think about what transpired between Abraham, his two wives, Sarah and Hagar, 
That wasn't a happy family. Abraham takes Hagar as a second wife. She gets pregnant and the harmony of his home is destroyed. What about Jacob and his two wives, Rachel and Leah? We see Rachel and Leah fighting each other for Jacob's attention and affection. We have that whole business with the mandrakes, whatever they were. And when we look at Leah, we see a somewhat tragic figure, the unloved wife. And then consider Elkanah and his two wives, Peninnah and Hannah. Elkanah loved Hannah and showed her favouritism and this provoked Peninnah who made Hannah's life miserable. That wasn't a very happy home. What about David's household? Well, as we've already noted, it was a total mess. And then there was Solomon's household, and we, we know where polygamy took him. With polygamy, it's one story of unhappiness and disharmony, jealousy and strife. And I think we're supposed to notice that as we read the Old Testament. I came across an excellent article on this subject in my study. I'm going to share a few sentences with you. I think this is very helpful. The reason scripture records so many instances of polygamy and concubinage is not to endorse these actions, but to condemn them and show just how destructive such, such sexual perversity proved to be. How the biblical authors choose to describe events often reveals their judgment on those actions. The case studies above, okay, the article mentions Lamech, Abraham and David, show that the biblical authors never commend the polygamists in the Old Testament, nor are they indifferent. Instead, they are often at pains to show the devastating consequences of deviating from God's established pattern of monogamy. So, there was the commandment for kings, and there is the way the story is told in the Old Testament. These demonstrate that God did not approve of polygamy. And then finally, point number three. We have to consider this question. Where do we get our ethics from? Now, this is a much larger discussion, but I think we can distill it down for our purposes this evening. Where do we get our ethics from? Or to put it another way, what is the basis for determining right and wrong? Do we rely solely on the commandments in the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, to determine right and wrong? Is that the extent of it? If it is, if we rely only on the commandments in the Bible, then we have a problem because, as I said, there is no direct explicit command in the Bible prohibiting polygamy. Now, the answer to this question is no. We also derive our ethics from creation. And not just from com the commandments in Scripture, but also from the account of creation in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. This is what Jesus did regarding the subject of marriage. So this is not my idea. This is not something that theologians have come, with, come up with over the centuries when they've tried to study ethics. Uh, this is what we see our Lord doing when he walked among us. When Jesus was asked a question about divorce, what was the basis of his answer? What God ordained in creation. Mark chapter 10, verses 6 through 9. Jesus said, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Notice that Jesus didn't say, as it is written in the law, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Okay, the foundation for his assertion about marriage was not the commandments given at Mount Sinai, but the creation of man and woman in Eden. He derived an ethical or moral principle and a fundamental one, the definition of marriage, from creation. And from there he answered the question about divorce. Divorce. 
Now, according to what we see in creation, what constitute, constitutes marriage in terms of sex? Male and female. It involves people of the opposite sex. By definition, marriage excludes people of the same sex from entering into it. What about in terms of number? <laughs> it involves two persons, not three or four or seven or seventeen, two. Jesus said, quoting Genesis chapter 2, the two shall become one flesh. Two people, a man and a woman, who complement each other biologically and emotionally and in other ways become one flesh. Now, as an aside, this is why after countries legalise same-sex marriage, there is no logical basis for not legalising polygamy. If it's wrong to discriminate on the basis of sex, why is it okay to discriminate on the basis of number? Okay, if, if marriage is only about formalising a loving commitment, then why shouldn't it be open to every kind of loving commitment, every kind of arrangement? The point here is that God's design from the beginning was monogamous marriage. One man, one woman. In a sense, God didn't need to make a law that defined marriage or a law that prohibited polygamy. The principle or the law of monogamous marriage was there from the beginning. It was definitional to marriage. Polygamy and concubinage have always been contrary to his will. So, was it wrong for men in the Old Testament to have more than one wife? Yes, it was. David should not have had multiple wives, or Abraham, or Solomon. God's will was clear, and it was known. There is, in fact, no justification whatsoever in the Old Testament for polygamy or polyamory or any kind of arrangement apart from monogamous heterosexual marriage. What we read in the Old Testament is not a problem. It doesn't challenge the Christian sexual ethic. Rather, it affirms it. Now, I realise we've covered a lot of ground this evening and I'll open the floor for some questions in a moment, but I want to finish with four lessons to take home and I promise I'll be very brief. I have made you work fairly hard tonight. Lesson number one, David's polygamy reminds us of our fallenness. Even the best of men is a man at best. In this area of sexuality, David messed up. The temptation to fulfil his desires proved too much for him. As king, he had the power to have many women and he couldn't resist. The great man of God was a fallen human being, susceptible to the world, the flesh and the devil, just like you and me. David needed God's grace. And so do we. That brings us to lesson Number two, that David became a great man despite his disobedience is a testament to God's mercy. Relationships with at least 18 women, that was so wrong. And not to mention his behaviour with Bathsheba. And yet the Lord was merciful. He was kind to David. He protected David. He prospered David. And he is merciful to us, isn't he? We all have sexual sins that we're ashamed of. We've all transgressed, at least in our thought life, in our heart. And yet God has been kind to us and forgiven us and blessed us with families and with friends and with so many good things. And praise God for his mercy. Lesson number three. The examples of polygamy in the Old Testament show the folly of of departing from God's plan for sexuality and marriage, they don't justify it. When we step outside of what God has ordained, things get very messy. That's the message of the Old Testament. 
So let's be faithful to our, to our Lord Jesus in this area, whether we're married or single. And then finally, lesson number four, when we think about polygamy and other forms of sexual immorality, we are reminded of the importance of the doctrine of creation. It is absolutely essential to the Christian worldview. It's fundamental to our understanding of gender and marriage and many other aspects of our existence. We would be all at sea, morally, relationally, socially and spiritually, without those first three chapters in Genesis. We wouldn't know who God is and we wouldn't know who we are. This explains much of what's gone wrong in our world today. People don't know or don't believe the doctrine of creation. All of the confusion out there about these things, about marriage and sexuality and gender, all of the confusion out there really shouldn't surprise us. And so as we follow Christ... May we ever hold fast to this doctrine and never grow weary of deepening our understanding of it. May God help us and may he richly bless the teaching of his precious word. Amen.